I would like to give my view on this question, why are mo most clinical research findings not spectacular? First of all, I'm a clinical researcher, but I have no other uh, conflicts of interests. As outlined, this was the question, why are most clinical research findings not spectacular? And Jon and Niklas just touched upon this. An alternative title could have been perhaps less is more, or perhaps another one bites the dust. In uh, recent years, we have many seemingly uh, promising interventions, which actually fail to be of benefit to patients. And we can continue a bit. So, and even some of the interventions, well, some were neutral, but some were also actually harmful. As touched upon by Anders in the first uh, talk, uh, the authors of this uh, systematic reviews looked into these uh, trials. They had identified 24 randomized trials uh, uh, describing 15 interventions and actually eight of them were harmful. So in other words, increased mortality. So why is this? Well, the framework or the theoretical framework from f for my talk is this association between bias or methodological quality and effect. So the more bias or the lower quality, the larger effect. The other framework, again bias or methodological quality and years, so past and present. So over the years, it is my opinion that the quality has improved or bias has been reduced. So research findings are probably affected by many factors. Some are listed here and I will briefly go through some of them. First of all, blinding. In this uh, work, the authors compared uh, the intervention effect in adequately blinded versus inadequately blinded trials. And they found a difference, a difference in the magnitude of 13%. So unblinded trials are perhaps likely to, to result in inflated estimates in the area of 13%. So that, in other words, translates into it may overestimate benefit and underestimate harm. Looking into design or the importance of design, in this very nice uh, uh, paper on, on uh, safety of Digoxin, uh, the authors looked into a lot of studies and this figure here nicely illustrates the difference between trying to answer uh, questions on interventions in observational data versus in randomized controlled trials. So first of all, they pooled all the studies, observational studies using unadjusted relative risk and found a certain uh, summary estimate. Then they tried to do it a little bit better, looking into the adjusted relative risk and the point estimate or the, or the summary estimate was reduced. They wanted to look into it in more depth and tried to look in into it by time to event and that reduced the, the estimate even more. Then they started doing propensity matching First, first, and then afterwards they did propensity matching with time to event. And as you see, the, the effect estimate decreased and decreased. And then when you started examining this in a randomized clinical trial, which I guess is, is, is the way to do it with an intervention, it, it looks like that there are, is absolutely no difference or digoxin is safe. So you need to think of the design when you answer your questions and look into especially intervention effect estimates. So again, this will result in inflated estimates, or can result in inflated estimates at least. Fragility or the fragility index, there has been published a lot of lit literature on this lately. This is the number of events uh, uh, which needs to be, the, the number of events which need to be added to a trial in order to change the result from a statistically significant result to a non-statistically significant result. And what you see here 
is a, a, a review of uh, multi-center randomized trials in critical care, which all reported statistically significant effect on mortality. And as you see, the, the, the fragility index is very low. Zero, one, two, three, so almost all of them are here. And then you can ask, what is the fragility index of zero? That was just changing the statistical test that resulted in a non-statistically significant effect. So a, a very, very few events in the other group in order to change the result. So obviously, this may, may increase the risk of a type 1 error. Not very robust results. Looking into the pretest probability. Well, an example from my everyday life. During the winter, uh, th the chance of me riding my bike to work is very, very low. At best, 19 to 1. So the chance of me losing weight in the winter is low. Well, in the spring, and yes, this is the spring in Scandinavia, or at least in Denmark, the chance of me riding my bike in the spring is larger, maybe 1 to 1. So the chance of me losing weight in spring is larger. Whereas in the summer, I will most likely ride my bike to work, and the chance of me losing weight in summer is larger. So obviously, you need to, to, to challenge or, or interpret your results in light of the pretest probability. Also, financial bias receives a lot of attention, especially these days. In this recent systematic Cochrane review, the authors compared trials assessing drug and devices which were funded by the pharmaceutical industry versus uh, drugs and, uh, and devices not funded by the pharmaceutical industry. And they actually found a nearly 30% increased effect in the trials funded by the pharmaceutical industry. And they tried to correct this for other risk of bias domains and the results were consistent. So in other words, trials funded by the, pharma pharm pharmaceutical, uh, by the pharmaceutical companies are more likely to report uh, uh, positive effects. Again, this may overestimate benefit and underestimate harm in trials. Data fabrication has also received a lot of attention these days. The Carlisle paper just recently published. And when looking into data fabrication, you try to compare the expected effect versus the, rep oh sorry, the expected difference and the reported difference in baseline characteristics. And if this reach reaches a certain threshold, this could be an indication of fraud. And we have some examples also within our, speci our specialty on fraud. Also, effect size has probably something to do with it. In this systematic review, the authors looked into, uh, they compared the effect size of the trialist, as we speak, uh, talked about earlier, or the one sponsoring the, the trial versus other independent trialists. And for some trials, this is ongoing large randomized trials in critical care. For some trials, the, the, the trialist or the principal investigator expected an effect size that was comparable to the independent uh, trialist, whereas in other examples, the, the, the principal investigator of the trial expected a very high effect versus the, the independent trialist, which expected a very low. So there may be discrepancies in this. And again, this will result in inflated estimates. And regarding outcomes, there is this very nice uh, sorry, paper from the British Medical Journal, and they have compared the effect size of surrogate outcomes on non-patient-centered outcomes versus patient-centered outcomes. And they actually found that surrogate on non-patient-centered outcomes, that could be the level of a biomarker or blood pressure or something like that, overestimate the effect of up to 50%. So finding a significant difference between two interventions using a surrogate outcome has also the potential to result in inflated estimates. Predefined analysis is very important. 
in this paper, the authors looked into they they looked into a certain time period of anesthetic journals, and they looked into how many of the of the randomized trials reported in these anesthetic journals were registered, and they found 59. That was two thirds of the randomized trials published in the anesthetic journals. And then they looked into how many of these trials were registered. And before trial, only 20 of the 59 trials were registered. 23 were registered during the trial, and some were even registered after the trial was completed. And moreover, some of them changed the primary outcome, both before, during, and after the trial. So predefined analysis is probably very important. And obviously this is called reporting bias. Also, the term we have heard it a couple of times today, we have heard about systematic errors or bias, but there's also a term called random errors. These authors looked into the effect of random errors, that's sort of how much power has the results in a certain systematic review, and they worryingly found that only 50 sorry, 54% uh, of, of all the trials maintained a type 1 error below 5%. And concordantly, only 34% 34, 34 maintained a power of 80%. So many trials are severely underpowered. And this obviously increases the risk of random errors. Publication bias can also be a problem. In this work, the authors looked into, found that 29% of randomized trials reported on clinicaltrials.gov were not published. So obviously it's not, an, uh, it's not confirmatory that this is publication bias, but there are a lot of trials which doesn't ha are, n are not published. So it could be. So what are the consequences of these methodological flaws? Well, for researchers, and from, from clinicians, this is obviously very disappointing. Also, it may cause difficulties, difficulties in publishing, also difficulties in funding, as Nicholas touched upon earlier. But on the other hand, I think that this may lead to a less complex everyday clinical practice, because I think we can get rid of a lot of sorry, interventions, and this will make, make our everyday clinical practice less complex. What about for, for the patient perspective? Well, obviously, I think that, that the care is more patient important now, as touched upon earlier. Also, getting rid of interventions reduces the risk of adverse drug in, uh, interactions and also reduces the potential for harm. For the society, I mean, I, I think this results in better health care and more efficient and rational use of the sparse resources. So in summary, research findings are affected by many factors, of which I have tried to, uh, to outline some of them. In my opinion, patient care has improved significantly over the years. I think we should stop talking about that research, clinical research findings are not spectacular. I think that we should acknowledge that clinical research findings are indeed spectacular as they are patient-centered. Thank you. <laughs>